Well, 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 here we are with another chin wag, Steve. Hello, I'm Paul Giamatti, and I'm joined by my co-host and cohort in weirdness, the distinguished philosopher and author, Stephen Asma. Hello, hello, yes, and we have a really great episode for you all today. We had so much to talk about on Chinwag, we didn't have a chance to get to everything. So today, we bring you more of that chat. Yeah, before we get into it, though, thank you to all our loyal listeners for writing in. We love hearing from you, so please keep it up. And don't forget, you can also follow us on Spotify. And thanks to Spotify for showing us so much love and support. And, uh, and don't be stingy. Tell your friends about us. Text them a link to this very podcast right now. They'll thank you for it. Okay, okay. enough of that. <laughs> You've written on zombies. The history is fascinating. I know it's a huge history, but like, could you give listeners a little potted history of the zombie that we could then dig in on? Yeah, the the zombie has not been a huge part of popular culture for as, as long as people might imagine. Um, it really came to mass awareness in 1929. Um, before that, it was something that you might read a mention of it in like a travelogue to the Caribbean or something like that. But in 1929, um, a writer named um, William Seabrook puts out a book mm -hmm. called The Magic Island. And Seabrook was an interesting guy. He had traveled the world, um, sort of inserting himself into local cultures. And he was obsessed with the occult. And he was even friends with Aleister Crowley. Um, no. He was an odd guy. And he spent a year in Haiti. And he wrote this book about it. And chapter seven of the book is entirely about zombies. And so he was the first guy to bring this to the mass attention of the American public. The book mm. sold very well. Within a couple of years of that book coming out, uh, there was a zombie play on Broadway, which failed after two weeks. <laughs> but <laughs> Amazing. The did, that did not fail is the 1932 film White Zombie starring Bella wow. Lugosi, which mm -hmm. was a huge hit. It was made on very little money. It was produced independ independently outside of Universal or any of the other big studios, and it made a fortune. And it was he famous? Of, Just real quick aside, was yeah, Lugosi was he, did famous he done then, Dracula no? already? Was he already? He had already made Dracula, and it was he was kind of in some weird contractual loophole with Universal, <laughs> and so okay. he was able to step out and go do this this film, which probably took him, I think, something like five days to shoot or <laughs> sure. something. And uh, that made zombies huge. Um, after White Zombie hit in thirty two, we get a ton of these voodoo zombie films. Yeah. Um, going throughout the 30s and 40s. And, and then in the 50s, we get the the beginning of the sci-fi zombie, which are uh, brought about by atomic radiation, that kind of thing. And then, of course, it isn't until 1968 that Romero comes along and gives us the, um, the zombie that is out to consume human flesh, which was uh, not part of any zombie folklore before 68. Oh, so he completely wow. invents that he idea. Invented. I didn't realize that, that it was Yeah, I thought he was invention. drawing on the tradition, but he invented that. That's crazy. He did. And in fact, if you watch Night of the Living Dead, they're never called zombies in the movie. Um, he resisted using that word. Even in Dawn of the Dead, which is 10 years later, that word huh. only pops up once. Huh. Um, and he said that he thought of them as ghouls because he had grown up with the tradition of these Caribbean voodoo zombies. And he didn't Different think of thing. them as the same thing. Yeah. And voodoo, they're they're used as kind of it's people who are resurrected. If I get this right, to kind of be used as sort of carry out tasks, like a tool. Yeah, sort of. It's like a golem or something a little bit, isn't it? I mean, it's like it a is. sort of resurrected body that will then do your bidding a little bit, right? I actually think it's kind of a uh, metaphor for the horrors of slavery because mm -hmm. oh. it was mm -hmm. in the Caribbean where you had black laborers and. Mm -hmm. The idea was that even after you died a voodoo bokur, which was the name for the sort of what we would call a witch doctor, mm -hmm. could resurrect the corpse and make it continue to work out in the field. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, it's interesting that in the traditional folklore, there are a few spins on it that you don't see used much in the movies. For example, they have to eat – but they can only eat very simple food like gruel. And oh. if you ever give a zombie salt or meat, it will immediately regain consciousness and go rebury wow. itself. Really? Oh, weird. 
Wow. Fascinating. That's cr that's crazy. I Walked with a Zombie is a pretty good movie. That's a creepy film. Yeah, I've it's seen a very it. creepy movie. Yeah. But it's, it's got super... racial like oh, yeah. undertones. Uh, in how it could it not? Really... I mean, all of it all of it's got unbelievable I mean, anxieties just, about race. Yeah, all of the anxieties about race and that stuff is is pretty intense. Yeah. Um that's there was a uh, the Serpent and the Rainbow, which is a which is a, a good, decent movie, but that book, it was a book. And what was the story with that? The guy, it was a he was like an ethnobotanist who looked into the whole reality of the zombie thing, right? Yeah, Wade Davis. He was a Harvard trained ethnobotanist, and he um, is the one who kind of first suggested that zombies were actually people who hadn't died but who were in a drugged state that rendered uh -huh. them with that kind of no intelligence, no willpower thing. And um, he has been largely debunked. Has he? But no. there is still a lot of discussion over how much of what he said could actually be accurate. They they go back and forth on that a lot. Interesting. I know Z Zora Neale Hurston also swore that she had seen a real zombie. And I was thinking, yeah, could, could there just be like, I know this is going to sound... I mean, uh, it, could there just be like terrible head injury cases or or illnesses that leave somebody, you know, compromised? Catatonic with, or something yeah. or sort of. And uh, then people just misunderstand what's happening. You know, is that is that possible? Like, what do you think it is? Or is it just yeah. le lore and legend? I suspect you're absolutely right. The Zora Neale Hurston story is is really interesting and has a little bit of a tragic overtone to it. And um, she even included a photo of the oh, person she okay. was told was a zombie. It's in her book, really? Tell My Horse. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good book. I recommend it highly. And um, yeah, I suspect you're right that there are probably people who were injured or um, in some way that they didn't get proper care. It's a very hot region. Maybe they've got severe heat stroke on top of whatever mm. else is going on. And and perhaps it puts them in some kind of suggestible state because the idea of being controlled was always part of it. Do we think Frankenstein is like the first zombie story? I always wonder, like, why it's not called a zombie story. Because it is, it is, isn't it, in a lot of ways? I argue it's not. Um, okay. And I actually do see, uh, I think the Romero zombie and the voodoo zombie are the same creature. And I think the, the things they have to have is it is a physical body. It's not a ghost. It is resurrected from the grave. But it has no willpower or real intelligence. Mm-hmm. Which it lets Frankenstein out. So Frankenstein, oh, yeah. because he, he has will. Smart. And he has, the creature is smart. He is smart, right. which people, I think, forget that he right. speaks yeah. and he's smart. And I guess he's... He like learns language, like outside yeah, the no, window or something. He, he talks like, yeah, he talks, yeah. And I mean, I guess is he, is he... I can't remember in the book. I haven't read the book in so long. Is he cobbled together from bodies or is he, or is he, he is. just he's one body single parts. body? Yeah, yeah, I could never remember. And, and vampires have no relation to them either, do they? I mean, because yeah. it's like... Although the early vampire lore, when you look back, I mean, the 19th century Bram Stoker vampire thing, no. But when I read about sort of earlier vampire lore, that mm. sounds like the same thing, kind of, or mm. similar. I mean, it's not like, I guess your worry is the person's going to come back to life. Is that right? I'm not sure about some of the earlier stuff. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the earlier stuff is kind of what I call zombie adjacent. Um, mm -hmm. It's <laughs> zombie adjacent. It, That's our whole show. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> yeah, the if you look at like the early Eastern European folklore on zombies, they they do tend to be described as things that had very little intelligence. They would emerge from the grave and just be ravenous for blood, and they would gorge themselves and go right back to the grave. They were not glamorous or sexy or any yeah. that kind of thing. No, they were kind of, yeah, mindless, too. There's a story that, I'm, I'm going to get all the details wrong on this, but there was, like, people were dying even as late as, like, the, the late 19th century, so we're talking about the late 1800s, where um, people were dying of consumption, and there was a fear that uh, this girl, this was in Rhode Island. She's like the vampire Rhode Island. They they thought she was coming out of the grave and feeding on family members when, in fact, they were just suffering from this illness. Oh. They went in and they they cut her head off and then they made a like a, some kind of a tincture from her bone and fed it to the brother so that he would then be cured and no longer attacked by the by the vampire. And well, he died like a few months later. 
the whole thing was a, just debacle. But when, that was, you know, when late was 1800s. This? Late 1800s. This is like the 1890s, I think. Wow. I, I know about the disease. I think it's porphyria that a lot of people have suggested vampirism might stem from. But I hadn't heard that case. That's very interesting. What's porphyria? It's a, a real disease that uh, apparently it renders you, um, you have a hard time with extreme light. You tend to seek the darkness. You, um, I think, have anemia. It's this, this thing that you can see how it could be mistaken for vampirism. One thing that I, I like to think about monsters, I think about the that they're a threat and then there's also sort of a, a security response to that threat. And in the zombie case, I just wonder if we could talk a little bit about like what's the real threat that we're mm. culturally rehearsing? What like, are we afraid of? Part, yeah, is it, is it the contagion thing? Is it the grid going down? You know, like, and then you see like the responses could be like, well, maybe the military or the military is going to fuck it up and it's going to be lay people are going to, you know, respond. medicine's going to fuck thought. it up. And the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like the medical establishment's going to blow yeah. it or something. Yeah. What's the popularity of zombies about now, you think? Uh, my theory is that it represents our fear of conformity. Um, mm -hmm. That know. after death, we will be stripped of our individuality and just be made to be these lumbering things that are bent on consumption. Um, and I think it's no surprise that zombies really rose in popularity in the 70s when there were all kinds of counterculture movements. People were being encouraged more and more to express and explore their individuality. Mm. Um, and oh, along comes this this thing where you are just reduced to a member of a horde. I think the horde is very important within yeah. the zombie mythology. And, and yeah, and on the other hand, you have the heroic hunter or survivalist who is the person who is um, standing alone against this, this shambling, mindless horde. That makes sense. They're kind of just pure death, too. They're just sort of yeah. death manifest and walking around is the thing to me that makes them particularly sort of creepy and menacing. And they're grotesque and they're just rotting. And that does sort of symbolize, I mean, that's a, it's what's going to happen to everybody. Yeah, no, yeah, you definitely. Know, so there is, it's like the fundamental fear. That we have, yeah. I'm always curious about somebody like George Romero. I always, I was saying this to you, Steve, about like, is he a guy? Was he? Was this just a? Was this? Was it the thing that he found, and then he just figured I have to just keep following this out to its logical conclusion because this is my thing, or was it like I'm really into this stuck? and I need? Yeah. Well, I mean, in other words, was he stuck with it? Or did, was it something that he was like genuinely like, I've mm -hmm. been fascinated with this. This is something I have to keep investigating. Or was he a little stuck with it? He was stuck with it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> really? Was, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> there's a, well, there's I wonder a, about those guys often, yeah. like so yeah. much with the sort of horror meister guys. And I was saying to, to Steve, I know one of these, some of these guys. And I often wonder, I've never just said to them, like, are you stuck with this? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to, yeah. but tell me more about it because... There's a um, a great book that's coming out in a couple of months called Raising the Dead, which is by a friend of mine, Adam Hart, that he had access to Romero's archives. And he found mm -hmm. out a lot of things about Romero that no one else has ever unveiled Whoa. before, including the fact that he made a complete feature film before Night of the Living Dead, which he didn't finish. But it's not horror. And mm -hmm. he was writing a lot of screenplays. Before and after Night of the Living Dead, not horror. Mm -hmm. um, he and his financial partners fixed on horror as a way to make a movie that would make money. Yeah. And I think they were as shocked as anyone when Night of the Living Dead became this kind of cultural touchstone. And mm. um, he tried to kind of, I think, avoid going back to it. If you look at the movies he made after mm. uh, Night of the Living Dead, a couple are horror, a couple are not. Really? Uh, and it takes him 10 years, though, to finally go back to Dawn of the Dead. Uh -huh. And then that becomes a big hit, big enough that he can make whatever he wants. And his next film is a movie called Night Riders, which has not a whiff of horror. That's right. That's wow. right. It's yeah. a great movie. It's great. But it didn't make money. And What's after that about? That, What's Night Riders it's, about? It's great. Just, it please. is great. 
Yeah. It's it's about a troop of people who travel around. It's contemporary. They are a motorcycle gang, but they are a motorcycle gang that engages in jousting and lives by the rules of night. Yeah. And they have it's a sort of it's a kind of King Arthur and the Knights right. of the Round Table. Yeah. He has it, Ed Harris is sort of the central guy. who's kind know. of the King Arthur. Guy. Ed Harris is great. It's it's ultimately tragic because yeah. they end up realizing that this counterculture movement of theirs is going, destined to fail. And it's a beautiful movie, but it didn't make money. Um, so uh-huh. after that, Romero was really stuck forever with the horror stuff, and he wasn't always happy about that. It's a kind of it's kind of like a Renaissance fair thing, a little bit. Those guys on the right. motorcycles. It's like kind of motorcycle gang Renaissance <laughs> and fair. That thing. didn't make money. I don't understand. It's a great movie. It really is. <laughs> it's, I know, but it really is a great movie. I, no, I'll I, check it out. Yeah. yeah, no, it's worth watching. It really is great because I just wonder about guys like that. And Steve, you were talking about some book that he wrote that you that you were aware well, I, of. Yeah, I I recently read this book. Uh, by a writer in which the story is about a kid who gets trapped inside a whale. And it's an amazing mm-hmm. uh, book and it, oh. it's contemporary. But then apparently when looking at his back catalog, he was somehow paired with Romero at the very end of Romero's life to either finish a book or uh, or take it over. And I think it's called Rotters. And anyway, my brother was saying it was really good, and that got us thinking about Romero's legacy yeah. and how he he saw himself. Yeah, yeah that that writer is Daniel Krauss. Um, the book it, that he finished for Romero was The Living Dead. And, oh, um, thank you. As a as a shameless plug, he does the afterword to my book, The Art of the Zombie Movie. Uh, oh, great. Okay, it all comes <laughs> together in the chin <laughs> way. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> totally. Well, this was amazing. Thank yeah, you thank for you joining. So I mean, oh, for joining us. So and the book, the books are great. The zombie book is beautiful. It's yeah, really gorgeous. beautiful, beautiful yeah, stuff. Yeah, thanks. It was a real bucket list item for me because I always wanted to do a big coffee table art book, and um, yeah, it was the. Yeah, it's huge. It's, it is it's huge. really giant. Yeah, <laughs> and it's beautiful. I mean, the reprints and well and researched. The, yeah, and thank you, Paul and Stephen. This was great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Chinwag is a production of Treefort Media and Touchy Feely Films, hosted and executive produced by Paul Giamatti and Stephen Asma. Executive producers for Treefort are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman. Dan Carey is executive producer for Touchy Feely. Our series producer is Rachel Whitley Bernstein. Original theme music by Luke Topp, with additional music by Via Mardot. Oscar Guido is our executive in charge of production. Tom Monahan is head of audio for Treefort. Audio production supervision by Matt Dyson. Editing and mixing by Jeff Neal. Animation created by Alex Sokol. Research assistance by Aiden Brooks. Lastly, for more information, go to chinwagpod.fm and find us on Instagram or TikTok at chinwagpod or on Twitter at chinwag underscore pod. <laughs>